Hi teachers, this is Ashley Lennox and this is welcome to our Bite Size PD on building fact fluency. So our learning intention today is I'm learning about math fluency and the basic fact fluency kit so that I can help students increase number sense and fact fluency with fluency instruction. And our success criteria is that hopefully you'll walk away from this 30 minutes when you know how to receive the BFF kit and have some ideas of how you can implement fluency instruction into your classroom. So here we have our multi-tiered systems of support framework, and today specifically we are going to be focusing on the instructional hierarchy of acquisition, automaticity, and application. And you'll hear me reference this today as the AAA model. So jumping right in here, um, this is a quote from Joe Bowler and from the Fluency Without Fear out of Stanford University. The best way to develop fluency with numbers is to develop number sense and to work with numbers in different ways, not to blindly memorize without number sense. So hopefully today you'll walk away with a pretty good understanding of how to develop that number sense with students to move beyond just this kind of memorization, okay? So our rationale, we're going to be talking specifically about a tool that you will have the option to use in your classroom called the Building Back Fluency Kit. And here's why we chose this, is that we hear you. Um, teachers are continuing to ask for support in building fact fluency for students. We know that it is a struggle when students don't know their math facts. Um, we know that it, it does make does make instruction last longer, right? And we also have some data that we need to hear assessments that we engage with through Acadians that do assess that math fact fluency. The good news, maybe the bad news, is that it is not just Canyon School District, it is not just Utah, it's not just third grade or fourth grade or first grade. This is something that is coming up from district leaders across the nation. Okay, so this is a genuine concern of how do we help students engage with this process. Now, what we do also know is that we have collected data over the years and sixth grade math inventory data specifically has shown that that rote memorization and programs like Reflex simply were not bridging the gap that students needed to apply the skill. So um, what that means is that we started collecting that data from students that came in using Reflex in second grade, collected that data through sixth grade, and what we saw is that our data was not improving even though, even though students had years of access to Reflex. The other piece that we have used is Acadian's data. Looking at that pre-COVID computational data, we saw that it actually began to plateau. So what we know is that over time, students are not collecting, um, or are, are not, sorry, are not able to show that they know these facts, okay? So what that means though, all right? So I love this quote, and this comes from our curriculum map, but computational fluency refers to having efficient and accurate methods for computing. Students exhibit computational fluency when they demonstrate flexibility in the method they use, understand, and can explain these methods and produce accurate answers efficiently. So the three words that are bolded in there, we have efficient, accurate, and flexible. So oftentimes when we think about fluency instruction, we think about things like time tests, which they show whether a student is accurate and but they don't always show that efficiency and flexibility okay so we know that they can very quickly tell you what four times three is but not necessarily how they got there or some alternative ways to get there or what to do next right so i know what four times three is how do i apply that to four times five um, or four times four so Within our instructional guides, we do have this one pager of fluency in mathematics. So critical actions for you as educators. The first thing that we have found throughout is that anytime this is referenced in research, number talks comes up over and over and over and over again. So if you have not started engaging with number talks daily in your classroom, this would be a great place to start. This is going to be how you're going to build that number sense and fluency is within those number talks. We want to encourage multiple meaningful strategies for students to practice computation. So again, knowing what three plus two is, is great. And that's definitely something that we want students to have that familiarity with, but what next, okay? Um, next, building that conceptual understanding before expecting fluency. So when we say what three plus two is, do students know what that means? 
focus on flexibility rather than speed. And then lastly, this one we cannot say enough is that time tests really are not best practice for building fluency. Time tests are really kind of your outcome. It's not an instructional tool. So oftentimes when we see these, these time tests being used, we can also see that it has the opposite effect where we can inadvertently create a fear of math as well, which is not our intention at all in our instruction. So the bad news is that there is no silver bullet. We do not have something that we can, um, you know, just kind of hand out and poof, here we go. There's no magic wand or anything like that to fix that, fix fact fluency. Really what we want to focus on is that acquisition, automaticity, and application, okay? So again, when we think about time tests, that's that automaticity. How are we instructing students on how to acquire the skill? And then how are we giving them meaningful opportunities to apply the skill? So one tool that has come up, this is something that neighboring districts are using. Um, it's something that is coming up in the research that we're seeing from throughout the nation is this building fact fluency toolkit. So basic overview of this is that there are two toolkits. There is the addition and subtraction for first and second grade, and then there's the multiplication and division for grades three through five. So basic fact fluency instruction helps our students to develop deep conceptual understanding and procedural fluency at the same time, okay? What I love about these kits is that all of the materials are already included in them. The cards, the games, the videos, the facilitators guides, your online resources, games, activities, all of that is already set up for you following a scope and sequence. So what I was really impressed by when we got our first kit was that when you opened up the kit, the directions weren't, okay, teachers gather 45 index cards and decorate them to be this, this, and this, right? If you need index cards, the index cards are in there. If you wanna create additional things to put in like a practice station or a, a center, great. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But as far as what you would need to do to pick up and begin instructing using this kit is in there. Okay. The other piece that I love is that the online platform, um, there is a Spanish component as well. So if you are in a dual immersion school using Spanish, you do have Spanish pieces that you can use online. So your kit will be the same, but what you would engage with online would be in Spanish. Okay, so really quick, I just want to go through the brochure. This will just take a second of kind of what you can expect. Okay, so this is the addition and subtraction kit. And as we go through here, you can kind of see why it was developed, how it's put together, um, who it's for, which is you because you're here, right? Here's what I like is that when we talk about a lesson string, so if you've done number talks, you're probably very familiar with the idea of a number string. A lesson string is kind of the umbrella that a number string would be under. So the lesson string sequence starts with that very concrete representational abstract, that CRA model that you've heard us discuss before. So we start with that concrete piece with these image talks. So here's something that most students are probably familiar with, and that's with the lemonade stand, right? So students probably know what lemonade is. They're able to see the difference between the yellow lemonade and the pink lemonade, right? Very concrete here. And we can see that we have a pattern. We have one yellow, two, three, four, so on and so forth. Um, and that the amount of pink equals the number of yellows, okay? Then we move on to a more representational piece when we look at these dominoes here. So we take this idea of there's two lemonades, now there's two on the dominoes. So we get into that more representational. We very easily then move into this abstract using something like an anchor problem. So we started with adding one to each side of the lemonade, then one to each side of the dominoes. Now, my assumption is that looking at these anchor problems, we're going to be doing something very similar, but in a more abstract way. Other components of these lesson strings are the number talks, contextualized practice problems, games, and then the three act tasks. Okay, now what that does not mean is that each one of these is going to be within each lesson string, but that just kind of gives you an idea of all of the, the ways that students can engage with a lesson string. So the components are available 
uh, I'm sorry, they come both print and digital. So what that means is that your kit is going to have everything that you will need that kind of tactile piece of, right? So that's going to be where your game boards are, where your cards, your, your counters, um, your image talk, actual images. And then on the online platform, that's going to be things like your teacher tools, some of the listen and look fors, and those pieces, as well as some professional learning that you can also engage with. Okay, really quick too, I want to note is that when you get your kit, if you open it up, the first time I opened one up, it was like, okay, so what do I do with this? This is beautiful, but what, how do I know what to do? That's where you're going to find everything on the online platform. So have no fear. So the lesson strings, we touched on this really quick. I want to go into a little bit more detail. A lesson string is a cluster of related activities, tasks, and games for each context. Over the course of a lesson string, the students will discuss vibrant images using mathematical language as they mathematize real world situations. So here's what that means is that we're going to take a concept, right? So let's, um, we'll do doubles. Okay. So in the addition and subtraction kit, you're going to find that one of your first uh, clusters is about doubles. So within that doubling scope and sequence, we're going to have activities, tasks, and games that all have to do with doubles. Okay. Now, the other component is we keep talking about this AAA, right? The acquisition automaticity application. When we look at a component of a lesson string, what I want to really point out on, on this slide in particular is the idea that these lesson strings are going to follow that AAA model. So we start with acquiring whatever that factor is through things like image talks and tool talks. We're going to move throughout the continuum until we end in that application application phase of building fact fluency in practice games as well as that final assessing fluency and ways to do that. So image talks, tool talks, number talks, those are all going to kind of be in that acquiring of what's going on. Now um, when we get to that or, I'm sorry, acquisition piece. Now when we get to this next piece, we have anchor problems available in grades one and two, which is part of a shared writing activity. Then this is called optional routines. I, I kind of wish they wouldn't have called it that though, because they are just really great things that you can do in your class. Now, these are all based on the math language routines, which again, comes out of Stanford under Joe Buller and that mathematical mindsets idea. And what this is great for is it was developed specifically for multilingual learners. But over time, what we found is that these are routines that all students should be exposed to. And really when we think about it, all of us are learning the language of math, and that's especially true of our, our students in elementary. Moving on from that, we have the three-act math tasks, which are new to Envision this year as well, so it's something you're probably pretty familiar with at this point. The contextualized problems, the building fact fluency practice games, and then lastly, that assessing fluency piece again. So you can see again that we start with that very basic idea of um, acquisition, automaticity, and then we move into that application phase. So how do we do this, right? That's probably a question that you are asking. Um, so options can be contextualized to your classroom and school site. So really what I want you to see on this slide in particular, this comes right from the, the implementation guide is that there's a lot of options. There's a lot of ways that you can choose to engage with this. So this is one example of how they've, they've broken it down into six ways that you could use within your classroom, your team, or your school site. I did want to point out that option six is great if you do have a math interventionist at your building. Um, that's a way that you can do it. So if you see here, students are interacting with the building fact fluency kit twice a week but in two separate settings. So they're going to do it with you on Tuesday and then with the interventionist the following week on Tuesday. So you can kind of see that example there, okay? Again, really just showing that there's lots of options. So the scope and sequence, we talked about this a little bit. Once again, what I like is that you're not left to guess when to teach what, it's broken down for you. So I'm gonna start on the third through fifth grade scope and sequence that we're not going in order. We're not doing two, three, four, five, six, seven. We're going with what factors do students seem to grasp first, and then let's build on that to, to do what they can grasp next. So we're gonna start with twos, right? And we're going to move the, down the continuum to tens, fives, and then we end down here in those sevens and squares and near squares. 
Then what happens from there is students will have three contexts in which they interact with that factor that's going to spiral throughout. So they're not going to do three weeks of twos using toy bikes, honey bears, and shoes. They're going to do one lesson string of toy bikes. Then most likely it's going to be one lesson string of bowling, then grapes, then maybe they're going to do honey bears. So we're going to go back. So it's, there's going to be kind of this spiral that students will interact with. Okay, um, when we look on the left hand side for grades one and two, you can see that we start with that sums within five using three contexts that students are pretty familiar with. You're not going to be taking instructional time to teach students what toy cars are. Okay, it's a visual that most students are going to have a, a pretty, pretty full familiarity with in order to interact with those. For grades three through five, you're probably wondering where the ones and zeros are. Those are some, those are two factors that are going to be woven throughout each factor because it's something that students can get pretty simply. Now, I, I taught fifth grade for many years, and as I'm looking at this, I am going, I, I see that there were some groups of students that I had that I would want to start with a factor of two because they didn't have all of that background knowledge with this number sign. So I would start at the twos. I had other groups of students that I might be able to move down a little bit further and maybe even start with fours. Something else to consider as you're making some of those decisions as far as where to start um, is that you may want to start with twos regardless of where your students are. So that way you can teach the students the instructional routines moving forward. So again, here we can see that within a lesson string, how it reinforces the CRA model. So I'm going to come right here to our focus of plus or minus zero, one, and two. The sample context that I'm using is counting bears. Again, something students have probably used um, in your instruction. So we start with the image talk with those counting bears. We have the tool talk with the die. Then we have our number talk. And then there are other routines that you can also use as well. So that doesn't mean that you have to use all of the routines or even that all of the routines are going to be present within that lesson string, but know that there are lots of options. Something else that I like about this is that as much as I wanted to use a lot of those concrete pieces within my instruction, sometimes I didn't always know how. So this is a great kind of springboard for you to be able to incorporate some of those concrete pieces within your instruction. So for example, looking at this third through fifth, the paints, arrays, I have a wreck and wreck right here. Now a wreck and wreck may be something that I'm not quite sure how to use in my instruction. This gives me a great place to kind of start. Hopefully you're asking, when the heck do I do this, okay? We have a math block that we have packed um, with, with lots of good activities and things that students need to be successful in mathematics. So here's what this can look like. Um, within your math block, we have building number sense. This would be, in the past, we've talked about number talks, coral counting, and subitizing. Now using the building fact fluency kit, this is where you would use your image talks, tool talks, number talks and contextualized practice problems, not all in the same day, right? I'm going to do one image talk on, let's say, Monday, and then I might move into a tool talk on Tuesday, okay? So we're not doing all of these things every day, all right? That was another misconception that I had initially kind of diving into this. So we can build number sense. We have this red square around here because we've heard your feedback and we, we agree that we do need to have some more time built in for that building number sense. So next year, you're going to see the instructional guide shifting to instead of five to 10 minutes, it's going to be 10 to 15 minutes. So that will also give you more time to engage with some of these components of the BFF kit. The other piece that I want to point out is this contextualized practice problems is in italics because depending on what skill you're using is going to determine where you would use those contextualized practice problems. So if I'm doing a review, building number sense is a great place to put that. Now, if I'm kind of building on with what my lesson is for that day, then that's where we'd want to put out in that concept development. Okay, so this is in that 30 to 45 minute block of time. So this is where you might find a three act math task. If you're in grades one and two, an anchor problem, Again, those contextualized practice problems and third through fifth grade, that's where your optional routines would be found as well. Now, lastly, they have the fact fluency games. Those fit beautifully into your skill based instruction time. Um, and you saw kind of some examples of what this continuum looks like on those options pages. So here's 
the, the meat of it, okay? Um, we as a team have allotted funding for every first through fifth grade teacher to receive access to a kit. Now the kit itself does belong to CSD. It's going to be checked out to you just like your, your, your Reading Street textbooks or your Wonders textbooks have been checked out to you. So we have created a Canvas course to support you in that effective implementation. There are opportunities within that to self-select modules and you can receive up, or I'm sorry, you can receive $55 per completed module. And there are three modules that you can complete for the stipends. I cannot say this enough. You all have worked so incredibly hard over the last few years. We, we admire the work that you're doing with students. We know that you're doing your best and it's the ins, the outs, all of the, these things that are going on. This is not required, okay? So if this is something that you want to engage in, we'd love to help you through it. If you don't feel like you're there yet, we totally understand that as well, okay? So the Building Fact Fluency Canvas course does have the introductory modules. So those first four up here under this idea of introduction, this is where you're gonna go through a lot of, it's going to solidify kind of what we've overviewed just now. At the end of that, where it says how to receive your VFF kit, that's where you will determine whether or not the training is something that you want to do, okay? So you'll go through that, you'll answer a couple of simple questions, and then we will get a kit out to you within a couple of weeks. Um, once you have gotten your kit, then you can move on to your next introductory module, and that's getting to know your BFF. So there are four um, pages within that for you to review. A couple of those do have some longer videos incorporated in them. So just kind of make sure that you're setting aside that time if that's something that you want to do. Okay. Now, once you have said, yes, I want a kit, you've gotten a kit and you have a basic overview, these are the three modules that you can then engage with. So we have the image talk, tool talk, and number talk, the three act math anchor problems, optional routines, contextualized practice problems, and lastly, fact fluency games for purposeful practice and assessing fluency. You can do all three of those. You can do one of those. You can do them in any order that you want to. Okay, but each one of those is a $55 stipend. So you probably received the flyer through your email just a couple of weeks ago, but if not, we will have that available to you as well, um, as well as that self-enroll link, okay? So the expectation, the kit will be sent to your school and it will be checked out to you through your librarian following the textbook protocol. Now, if you change grade levels, if you are teaching fourth grade this year, but next year you're gonna be teaching second grade, you can exchange for the correct kit. Okay, so if you were using multiplication and division, now you can use that addition and subtraction. We'll just swap them out for you. Okay, we will have an inventory list for you as well as how to access the online components. So I hope this was helpful. Um, I hope that now we have kind of a better understanding of how to build number sense within our classrooms and best ways to support students. And I hope that you have a great day. Thank you so much for your time.